Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this evening's Artists and Inspiration Program, jointly presented by the Adirondack Diversity Initiative and the Adirondack Experience, the museum on Blue Mountain Lake. I'm Nikki Hilton Patterson, Executive Director of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. At the initiative, we work across five areas of community engagement to make the Adirondacks a more welcoming and inclusive place for all New Yorkers and its visitors. I would like to start this evening's program by acknowledging that the initiative's home office is on Wabanaki and Abenaki lands, and the Adirondack experience is situated on the Ab Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. Both the initiative and the experience are thrilled to continue our tradition of collaboration with tonight's presentation titled Race and Geography in the American Landscape Tradition. Tonight's scholarly showcase is part of the Experience Monthly Artists and Inspiration Series. And we are thrilled to have as our guest this evening, Dr. Maggie Chow. Dr. Chow is an assistant professor in art history at UNC Chapel Hill. She received her bachelor's and PhD um, master, uh, from Harvard University and completed postdoctoral work at Columbia University. She's currently working on a book focused on the legacy of American imperialism, connecting the metropolitan European American painters of the past with the more racially diverse global artists of the present. Throughout the evening, please feel free to submit any questions um, to, through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Dr. Chow will take questions directly following her presentation. Dr. Chow, it is an immense pleasure to have you with us tonight. Hi, thank you, Nikki, and um, good evening to everyone who's here for the program. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Nikki, and thank you to Cheryl and David at the Adirondack Experience for inviting me to participate in this program. Um, so because um, I'll be talking about landscape tonight, um, I thought what better way to begin than with a land acknowledgement, um, which will be different slightly from Nikki's because I'm coming to you from a different part of the country. So after all, um, the paintings that I'll be discussing today depict territory occupied by settlers of this country. And um, this is a history that's too often erased from the picture, um, both the pictures that we will be talking about and the picture that we inhabit today. So um, I want to say before I begin that I'm speaking to you today from Durham, North Carolina. And, um, and I recognize that this place where I live and work is the traditional homelands of the Shakori Eno and Tuscarora people. And this acknowledgement is a first step toward honoring the history and culture of the many indigenous people with ties to this place past and present. So uh, let me, hopefully everyone can see my screen now and I'll begin the talk. So describing uh, the prominent characteristics of the American landscape school back in 1865, the art critic, James Jackson Jarvis wrote, it sends its sons to Brazil, to the Amazon, to the Andes, beyond the Rocky Mountains. It orders them in pursuit of icebergs off frozen Labrador. It pauses at no difficulties, distance, expense, or hardship in its search for the new and striking. And Jarvis was not exaggerating. He had in mind pictures like this one, Frederick Church's Heart of the Andes, which just a few years before his writing had drawn some 12,000 paying visitors on its tour of the US. And Albert Bierstadt's Rocky Mountains Landers Peak, which had fetched a massive sum at the time of $25,000 in a recent sale. These anecdotes about the history of American landscape and its geographic expansiveness are well known. Today, I want to interrogate them in relation to race. How, I want to ask, did race play into a culture that clearly valued what Jarvis called the difficulty, distance, and expense that an artist would go in pursuit of the new and striking? <clears throat> 
To answer this question, I'll focus on the intersections of race and geography in the work of African-American painters of Church and Bierstadt's generation. Edward Mitchell Bannister, Charles Ethan Porter, Robert S. Duncanson, and Grafton Tyler Brown. On the surface, these artists appear to disregard race in their work. But what I want to suggest today is that even in a genre ostensibly um, oriented toward nature and not culture, race enters the picture through geographies real and imagined. To begin to understand these works as social and political requires that we see American landscape, the American landscape tradition itself as a constructor of racial, um, of geographic limits and racial ideologies. So as Jarvis's account with which I began suggests, geographic specificity was central to the way that landscape painting emerged and flourished in the 19th century US. Though it may not have been apparent in the paintings themselves, landscape art sanctified and mythologized spaces associated with white male privilege. It required and celebrated artistic mobility through racially codified spaces, and as a result, Geographic limitation tends to define the literal and symbolic relationship of African American painters to American terrain. But within such limits and restraints, we also find resistance. American landscape painting came of age in the mid 19th century at a historical moment when the still youthful nation was trying to broadcast to the world its own cultural identity and artistic potential. Artists like Thomas Cole and Asher B. Durand, who are often credited as the early pioneers of the genre of landscape, championed what they called the natural majesty of the new world as equal in pictorial interest and um, <clears throat> beauty as the old world's antiquities. They and the next generation of painters, a group known today as the Hudson River School, raise landscape from a genre associated with amateur sketching and documentation to a respected fine art capable of communicating high-minded ideals about American nationhood. Take, for instance, Cole's 1836 Oxbow, you see here, beyond the dark, dark, uh, stormy wilderness to the left, you see, um, around, beyond this ridge, you see this glorious pastoral landscape um, that uh, emerges from this um, storm that passes through that also symbolizes a kind of taming of the wilderness and a kind of manifest destiny. Cole even inserts himself into the picture. Um, he, he's, does, there's a tiny little self-portrait of the artist right here and there's his, his sketching umbrella um, as if to celebrate the fact that the very act of landscape painting um, is a contribution to the nation building efforts that um, are going on in the United States at the time. Durand, an associate of Cole, who actually traveled with him to the Adirondacks in 1837, um, at, in the 1850s published a series of articles celebrating and justifying the pursuit of landscape as uh, an American form of art. His Kindred Spirits, which you see here, is a memorial picture dedicated to Cole just after his death. And it shows the painter with the poet, William Cullen Bryant, enveloped in this kind of womb-like setting between trees and rocks as they contemplate this um, dramatic river gorge before them. The scene actually closely resembles a composition uh, by Durand of a forest view in the Adirondack Experience Collection, which I think shows the extent to which Durand was committed to picturing American land and American nature as this harmonious place in tune with supportive of American cultural endeavors. So by the middle of the 19th century, critics had declared landscape a, what they called a thoroughly American brand of painting. And the country's most prominent artists, most famous figures in the art world were landscape painters. But there is a paradox in landscape success, and these were geographical. So landscapes were meant to convey a kind of universal national message, but they also had to be grounded in topographical specificity in the sort of geology and botanical facts of a certain place. So Cole's Oxbow, for example, depicts an actual bend in the Connecticut River in Northampton, Massachusetts, which he used in the title. So he identifies exactly where this site is, even though it's meant to represent something greater. 
Um, so with increasing political divisiveness between North and South, between the cosmopolitan East Coast and the frontier moving from the Midwest out outward, the geographic specificity of landscape painting no longer felt so representative. So when Frederick Church, uh, as a, he was a student of Cole's actually, when he painted this earlier work in his career called New England Scenery, as a way to celebrate the historic birthplace of the nation, there were doubts as to whether this painting could really transcend the local for migrants moving west, for Southerners contemplating succession. And as local terrain became increasingly politicized during the Civil War, landscape painters began to travel further and further afield. And this is kind of the moment in which you have that quote that I began with. Um, they went to places like the Canadian Arctic, to the Caribbean, to um, the far west. So these regions were not apolitical exactly, but they were more distant from um, the divisive politics of uh, the states. Along with an awe for nature, these painters embodied a 19th century American ideal of uh, limitless geographical movement and spatial access. Landscape painters became at this moment American heroes worshiped for their intrepid exploration. Not surprisingly, artists who were white and male and wealthy were most successful at branding themselves intrepid travelers and wilderness experts. Their success depended on their ability to enter regions still inaccessible to a general public. Um, and uh, they often involved kind of self-funded artistic forms of expedition. So Albert Bierstadt, who is best known for his paintings of the Rockies, was one of the first artists to paint this, the Rockies, the region. Um, and it, he happened to be able to go there because he had a letter of introduction from the Secretary of War, which allowed him to tag along on a government sponsored surveying expedition that he paid his own way and he had private funds to do that. Landscape painters, even if unwillingly, promoted privileged forms of landscape tourism. So in the West, ties between painting and tourism took hold at this moment and can be felt even to this day. So just to give you an example, um, Thomas Moran, for instance, he worked closely with the tourism industry in the late 19th century to promote Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon, as well as himself. You see an ad here for the Santa Fe Railroad that has Moran's picture in it. Um, today, we imagine this region's national parks through his paintings. You can even visit Moran Point, what is called Moran Point in the Grand Canyon. Um, and we see this region through the eyes of entrepreneurial artists who followed um, in his footsteps into the 20th century, like Ansel Adams, whose popular images saturate our imagination of American wilderness by gracing calendar pages and Sierra Club posters. For the entrepreneurial white male artist of the 19th century, landscape was a genre of geographic possibility, enabling these artists to carry out long ambitious expeditions as well as more routine escapes from the city to nearby mountains and lakes. The geographic regions associated with the formation of the landscape tradition in the, um, you know, uh, Cole and Durand and the artists that sort of began painting landscape in America, um, those landscapes that they started depicting in the Northeast were actually sites of bourgeois summer resorts when the artists arrived. And as the artists uh, became more, their, their paintings became more popular, they in turn drew more visitors to those regions. Um, the Adirondacks is a region that benefited from this kind of mutual development of tourism and landscape painting. Prior to the 19th century, as probably all of you know more than I do, um, the region was a hunting and fishing ground for indigenous people and English and French settlers employed in the fur trade. It was often a space of territorial conflict between these groups as white settlers made land claims and depleted natural resources through trapping and logging. By the time preservation efforts began in the final decades of the 19th century, there was already an active tourism industry that um, promoted preservation and that also brought painters from back at, from all the way from sort of the early uh, prior to the Civil War when artists like Cole and Durand came to the region. 
um, as well as later, as you can see in this example from Samuel Pullman, both of these in the Adirondack Experience Collection. So alongside conservation, which established Adirondack Park, came the railroad that connected the region to urban centers in the Northeast, a 165 mile line that took only 18 months to complete, um, in part with the help of black laborers brought in by contract from the South. Connectivity led to a thriving summer resort industry where hotels with all your creature comforts were built into romantic landscapes. The tourism industry was driven by a back to nature mentality of getting away from the crowded, polluted city for an invigorating wilderness tour that it might include guided hunting and fishing. New York City-based landscape painters such as Sanford Gifford portrayed this vision of wilderness in paintings such as the Twi A Twilight in the Adirondacks, which is in the museum's collection. The foreground detail here on the bottom right shows the artists with fellow painters and their guide camping by a lake. Such landscape tourism was championed by cosmopolitan uh, industrialists, including those in Gifford's own family and others such as um, the sort of giants of the, of, of the um, sort of gilded age, like the Vanderbilts who were responsible for um, <clears throat> extending the railway into the Adirondacks and who in the same period constructed the village like great camps. Um, theirs was Sagamore, which is now open to the public. The Adirondacks have and still are associated with wilderness. The 6 million acre Adirondack Park um, created in 1892 has the slogan forever wild, but wilderness in this sense of a virgin place of respite and recreation is coded as white. The racial dimensions of wilderness would have been especially visible in the Adirondacks where for decades in the late 19th century into the 20th century, several of the largest hotels were employed, uh, employed all black wait staff in their summer um, seasons. Racial difference was deliberate here as a way to mark prestige for white client, the white clientele who in the region, who in the period were prone to marveling condescendingly at the gentlemanly manner of their servants. African-Americans are rare in landscape paintings of the Adirondacks, but one example in the museum's collection shows a black man cooking at camp in service to white clients who are shown lounging under the shade of a tree. Today, the Adirondacks is home to um, only 150,000 some permanent residents, but 9 million tourists descend annually, drawn to the region for the same reasons that attracted 19th century visitors, wilderness, um, and the activities of respite and recreation that have long been linked to white privilege. Black wilderness historically has been figured as physically and intellectually separate from this idea of white wilderness linked to tourism. So this is not to say that places like the Adirondacks were exclusively white. Um, the African-American presence in the region dates back to the 18th century when enslaved people were brought by white settlers, but after state emancipation, many remained. Then in the mid 19th century, a new wave of African-Americans arrived as a result of an agrarian philanthropic scheme developed um, by a New York abolitionist named Garrett, uh, Jarrett Smith who inherited substantial land in the Adirondacks from his fur trading family. And in 1846 began granting 40 acre plots to black to free blacks um, who were wanting to settle in the region. Frederick Douglass called these 200 some free blacks, quote, the sable arm pioneers of Franklin and Essex counties. And the incendiary um, abolitionist John Brown was drawn to settle with uh, with them in their community of North Elba. This short-lived social and ecological experiment met with failure as a result of the challenges of pioneer life in the region, especially because many of the settlers were um, trained in urban uh, professions and the passing of the Second Fugitive Slave Act that led many African-Americans to seek greater security in Canada. So, um, you know, I, I talk about this history because in the 1840s, when these settlers were arriving, um, this is just when the region is beginning to attract more urban tourists, these white tourists and the landscape painters that came along with them seeking ideals of wilderness. 
Blacks were trying to tame that same wilderness in the Adirondacks through toil and labor as pioneers. And these Black pioneers, I would argue, were not keen to experience this, this same space um, as a space of sport and leisure. In many ways, Black wilderness, the Black notion of wilderness in the 19th century had a very different um, kind of different connotations, connotations of danger and survival um, rather than leisure. And um, wilderness was linked by African-Americans in the period to the fringes of the plantation, to the frontier homestead, to routes on the Underground Railroad. In other words, places where nature provides sustenance and enables escape. Accordingly, African-American landscape painters of the 19th century experienced mobility and movement differently than their white counterparts. Travel was not always a choice, but a necessity, and um, their routes were determined often by exile. While white painters' movements can be mapped onto narratives of scientific exploration, imperialism, the pursuit of pleasure, the Black artist pathways trace um, routes of escape from persecution and discrimination. And the politics of these negative geographies can be found in their artworks. In other words, places that attracted landscape painters initially, um, like the Adirondacks, did so because they embodied an ideology of wilderness that was racially codified as white. This complicated the project of African American landscape artists. How were they to represent American land if they didn't perceive it and utilize it in the same way? No doubt the black figure that you see here in George Clow's camping scene working in service like so many of African Americans in the Adirondacks at that time viewed the landscape differently than his white patrons. But to what extent we might ask did black painters make evidence that alternate viewpoint in their work. By and large, African American landscapists worked within artistic conventions established by their white contemporaries, but this does, this does not mean that they were necessarily approving of those ideologies. For Edward Mitchell Bannister, a black artist in Providence, Rhode Island, conforming to dominant conventions was a form of activism in its own right. He wrote that he decided to pursue a career in painting after reading an article that had claimed, and I quoting, quoting him here, the Negro seems to have an appreciation for art while being unable to produce it. So he wrote that he had read this and this prompted him to um, pursue a career as an artist. In 1876, his now lost landscape under the oaks, which we can imagine is similar to the painting you're seeing here, was awarded a medal at the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. On account of his race, Bannister was at first refused entry to the very gallery in which his prize winning work was displayed. But in recollecting this incident, the artist was far from bitter. Rather, he celebrated his triumph as a step forward for his race. So he recalled that when he revealed his true identity as the prize winning artist, um, he says, quote, all were bowing and scraping to me. He went on to express pride in knowing that the jury had not known his race and therefore, he said, could not have had, quote, sentimental sympathy leading to the award of my medal. Bannister's paintings depict the scenery around Narragansett Bay in his home state in a style inspired by the Barbizon School, a group of French artists who gathered to paint the forests and fields around Fontainebleau. Bannister particularly admired the school's most famous member, Jean-Francois Millet, who he described as the profoundest artistic spirit of our time. The Barbizon School's infatuation with a particular region actually recalls Bannister's own focus on the local countryside rather than scenery further afield. Geographic fixity, however, was a racial limitation for Bannister rather than a choice as it had been for Millet and his colleagues. Bannister did on occasion paint black farm workers as diminutive figures in the middle ground, the right middle ground here of hay gatherers, for instance. This pair of women shown in the act of harvesting echoes the bent figures of Millet's famous gleaners. Bannister's quotation of Millet, though in a very small detail rather than in a larger composition, nevertheless speaks to his interest in asserting African-American visibility in a genre that, as he well, known, well knew from personal experience, excluded Blacks as both subjects and makers. 
not all Black painters receive the kind of race-blind national recognition given to Bannister. Many, like Charles Ethan Porter, who spent most of his career in Connecticut, um, found that racist views prevented him from uh, have finding a ready market for their work beyond the local community. Porter was the only Black professional artist actually documented to have traveled to the Adirondacks in the 19th century, which he did for six weeks in 1880. The trip took place at a point in Porter's career when he had received increasing recognition for his still life paintings, an area in which he specialized. Porter studied art um, at the National Academy in New York City, and though he had wanted to stay in the city, he decided to return to his um, hometown of Hartford uh, for financial stability. An ambitious and promising artist, the local papers are filled with commendations of the, you know, just how wonderful, just sort of how much his work was faithful to nature and brilliant points, uh, how he was a brilliant colorist. So locally, he was well, very well known and respected. In 1880, the nationally famous landscape painter, Frederick Church, whose work you've seen already in many instances, um, <clears throat> who was also a Hartford native, visited Porter in his studio and encouraged him to pursue landscape, which prompted this Adirondack excursion. Though there are no extant works that have been confirmed to be based on studies he made on that trip, this is the, as close as I've been able to come to a painting that could possibly have an Adirondack link, though it, it's a later work, not from 1880 when he made the trip. Um, so, uh, after returning from the Adirondacks, Porter declared himself a convert to landscape painting and vowed that he would never paint still life again unless satisfying a commission. This plan, however, was quickly abandoned to make ends meet. The next year, Porter was able to save up enough money to uh, go to Paris to study painting, as was very often the case with aspiring uh, artists in the United States, um, in part due to introductions that were made by another Hartford local, um, Samuel Clement, aka Mark Twain, who helped, um, who helped Porter establish himself in the expatriate artistic community of Paris. Porter remained in Europe for two years, spending some months even in Fontainebleau, where the Barbizon uh, school had had been based, painting some Barbizon-inspired landscapes. So, uh, and when he returns, despite his training, his foreign experience, Porter never accomplished his goal of becoming a landscape painter after he returned to the U.S. He first settled in Hartford, then had another stint in New York City, and then finally settled in Rockville, Connecticut, where his family was. His pursuit of landscape was mostly limited to some scenes painted in France um, and multiple studies of Fox Hill, his parents' Rockville home. Still life, which sustained Porter's career, was considered at the time a far lesser genre of art than landscape. In the late 19th century, it was most often associated with women amateur artists. And often by the later 19th century, Porter was often included in exhibitions where he was the only male artist. Porter's mobility through white spaces, first in his landscape tour of the Adirondacks and later in his trip to Paris, did not prove ultimately fruitful financially and professionally because of racial barriers. Frederick Church may have encouraged Porter to pursue landscape painting in 1880, but he apparently praised Porter's pictures, still like pictures that he would have seen, as the most unconscious pieces of painting he had ever seen. A comment that subscribes to period racial stereotypes about Blacks as primitive and childlike by nature. Church, a stalwart giant of the landscape school, had little respect for what he called quote unquote flower painters. And he actually uses this moniker to demean or make fun of his fellow landscapists when they dabbled in still life. That Porter was never able to convert his travel to the Adirondacks into valuable painting speaks to the ways in which race was written into the genre of landscape, even if unconsciously for the very people that supported Porter's career. For Robert S. Duncanson, the most successful African-American landscapist of the 19th century, racial politics was actually a key to his success. 
Aware of the racial implications of geography, Duncanson used topographical details in its work to communicate an African-American perspective for knowing viewers, often um, the white patrons who uh, that collected his work who were also abolitionists and activists. The son of a free black mother and Scottish Canadian father, Duncanson established his career in the then frontier city of Cincinnati, Ohio, where African-Americans found more professional opportunity than on the East Coast. The regional waterways that brought Cincinnati prosperity featured centrally in his Ohio landscapes. This view of Cincinnati, Ohio from Covington, Kentucky represents um, Duncanson's home city across the river as a beacon of industrial success. You see it, sort of the buildings up there along the river. <clears throat> against uh, it, sort of it, it pits that sort of industrial success against the rural landscape of Kentucky in the foreground. But the specificity of the view offers darker narratives as well about uh, race relations. The Ohio River at Cincinnati divides north and south, free from slave states. So the minuscule figures, the black figures in the painting's foreground, just you can, you can just barely make out, um, highlight the plight of the enslaved on the Kentucky side of the river. So for Duncanson's viewers, recognizing the geography of the site also means acknowledging that the black figures in the plantation foreground are doomed to enslavement, even when freedom is visible just across the river. A similar double meaning is at work in Duncanson's The Caves. This scene may be reminiscent of his white contemporary and friend, Worthington Whitridge, who also painted wooded landscapes. Both selected their views because of their links to tourism and to sort of the idea of the landscape, um, uh, visiting the landscape. In Duncanson's painting, the small figures you see uh, here are ascending a trail to a pair of cave mouths. Um, probably partaking in a popular pastime of taking geologic, uh, taking tours, guided tours of geological formations. Yet the lantern held by the first figure also suggests the clandestine nature of such subterranean environments, which often serve as hiding places on the Underground Railroad. Duncanson's work thus speaks to the layered politics of space. In his landscapes, we see sites that by virtue of their geographic location or environmental condition, signal differently, signify differently for white and black viewers. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Duncanson decamped north to Quebec for two years, turning to the Canadian landscape for new subjects. In the multicultural atmosphere of Montreal, he was well received by local painters and critics desiring to establish a stronger landscape tradition in their own right, as um, this is a moment in Canada where um, Canadians were seeking cultural independence from British rule. Later in his career, Duncanson increasingly took inspiration from lyr the lyrical lines of British romantic poetry rather than the particulars of American scenery. This 1861 uh, painting, Land of the Lotus Eaters, borrows its subject from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson about Ulysses and his men drifting onto this dangerously intoxicating island. Duncanson's version of that island, with its abundance of palms and ferns, recalls the New World Tropics of his contemporary who traveled there, most famously, uh, Frederick Church who um, was then identified with uh, views of the Caribbean and of South America. Duncanson's canvas, um, these tropical details of the, these botanical details, which Church had made his specialty, um, Church actually asked people to bring their opera glasses so that they could scrutinize these details of the botanical details. So in Duncanson's canvas, these same details are transformed into strange and unscientific specimens. Um, unable to make the kinds of extended frontier journeys that Church and other white painters could, Duncanson turned um, his literary landscapes into both an alternative and a commentary on that practice. In a way, we can imagine this as a kind of misquotation of Church rather than a following in his footsteps. Duncanson's Eurocentrism, thus his, you know, his turn to English rather than American literature, also signals a kind of rejection of the key tenets of American, the landscape tradition in the U.S. Um, that uh, he's, um, instead of traveling to 
um, and being inspired by uh, American scenery, he's turning to the European classical past. Um, this is the frontier, the sort of American scenery. What's unique about it is what was suit made, made it so suitable for landscape painting in the first place, that idea of wilderness, novelty, isolation. And all of these, we can see that Junkinson, by turning to this European literary tradition, is actually rejecting. Grafton Tyler Brown, the last of the artists that I'll uh, introduce today, was an exception for African American artists in relation to the frontier. Indeed, the frontier West was at the center of Brown's practice, first as a commercial graphic artist and later as a landscape painter. Born in 1841 to free parents in Pennsylvania, Brown traveled to California in 1855 as a young man, becoming in all likelihood the first professional African American artist in the state. His German-born employer, C.C. Kuchel, had relocated his lithography business from Philadelphia to the booming West Coast. After Kuchel's death in 1866, Brown took over the business and eventually established its own firm, G.T. Brown & Co. in San Francisco. Brown's lithographic work was oriented toward the development and marketing of the West. His output included maps of new settlements and land claims in nearby territories, cityscapes, views of ranches, as well as stock shares and stationery for mining companies. While he traveled widely in the same frontier territories that attracted East Coast painters like Albert Bierstadt, his output was entirely different. Brown's pictures focus on private property rather than on wilderness. He advertises services in Nevada, for instance, as a traveling artist who offered views of, quote, mills, mines, business houses, residents, et cetera, drawn in the finest style. Brown's lithography business was by all indications highly successful during the 1860s and 70s. He counted prominent businesses like Wells Fargo and, Louis, uh, and Levi, Levi Strauss among his clients. But by the late 1870s, the atmosphere of San Francisco, previously welcoming to entrepreneurs of color, became hostile as racial, racist sentiments led unions to exclude Blacks as well as Asians who had been working on the railroads from the workforce. It was perhaps in response to such racism that Brown began to distance himself from his race, identifying himself as mulatto, then quadroon in the 1870s, and in the 1880s census, he is listed as white. Though he was likely only so-called passing on paper, given his connections to other African-American businessmen in the city um, for whom he worked as a printmaker. That said, Brown was identified as white for the rest of his life, including on his death certificate. In 1882, Brown left California to forge a new artistic and perhaps racial identity. Abandoning his commercial graphic work, he established a studio in the Occidental Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia, and began advertising himself as a landscape painter. A local paper, The British Colonist, took note of Brown's presence in the city and published several articles praising the artist. None made mention of his race, identifying first, uh, identifying in one article as a quote, local celebrity in California, and in another one as our local artist and a pioneer artist of our province. This painting, Mount Hood from John Day Station, was produced during the decade in which Brown was a self-proclaimed landscapist. In a nod to his lithographic background, even the most topographically dramatic vistas in Brown's hands are rendered rather matter-of-factly <clears throat> without the kind of theatrical romanticism of his East Coast contemporaries. And instead you find actually the details like this, the railroad track that comes into the foreground, which sort of suggests the, sort of li the, the links of this region to the rest of the country, something that had sustained Brown for, throughout his career as a printmaker. Like Duncanson, Brown's self-imposed exile away from the United States were, was professionally beneficial. In Canada, where there were not what was not yet a landscape tradition um, grounded in local terrain, these artists found greater professional respect and recognition. For Brown, the exile was also deeply personal since his success and his newfound mobility went hand in hand with the erasure of his racial identity. For a decade, Brown was incredibly itinerant, 
From Victoria, he moved to Tacoma, then Portland, then Helena, Washington, just outside Yellowstone. In each locale, he was prolific, selling his numerous paintings for modest amounts, at most a few hundred dollars, in the local or tourist market. In Helena, he married a French-born woman and in 1892 abandoned his career as a painter to settle in Minnesota as um, working as a civilian draftsman for the Army Corps of Engineers. By the time that Brown abandoned painting, the landscape tradition, as it was defined back in the 1830s and 40s by Cole, Duran, Church, and other white East Coast men, that tradition was on its way out. It was waning. Even Albert Bierstadt, once a best-selling superstar artist, declared bankruptcy in 1895. It was not until the 1920s that landscape painting enjoyed an aesthetic rebirth with the advent of American modernism. This revival of landscape coincided with another rebirth, the, emergent, uh, the embrace of African-American culture and experience in the Harlem Renaissance. In response, a great number of Black artists like uh, Malvin Gray Johnson, Aaron Douglas, William H. Johnson, and others turned to landscape. But unlike their 19th century predecessors who I've introduced today, Duncanson, Bannister, Brown, um, who each in his own way tried to erase, diminish, or mask their presence on white terrain, this new generation of modern painters worked to establish, to lay claim to American land as black space. Thank you. And I'm happy to um, take questions uh, from the audience. If you'd like to post them, um, I can answer your questions. Well, Maggie, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. I'm David Kahn, Executive Director of the Adirondack Experience. And I wanted to express our appreciation to you for joining us this evening and to Nikki Hilton Patterson for introducing the program. And maybe a, a couple of questions that have come in. One, uh, I think you alluded to the training of one of the African-American artists, but could you speak a little more to the issue of how did they train? Did they go to the same kinds of academies? Was it an apprenticeship system? Was it self-trained or, or how did that exactly work? Yeah, um, great question. So. Uh, these are all, I mean, we should remember that these, um, these artists were all, that ones that I discussed were all benefited from a system in which um, they had su financial support of one way or another from local, often from local members of their local community. Um, and this enabled these artists to sometimes go as far as going to Europe to train, um, which was unusual, um, but not entirely uncommon. There were other African-American artists, not landscape painters, but who did go to Europe. And that was sort of the epitome of like artistic training in the 19th century US. Um, others studied at local academies in the, you know, domestically in art academies, like the National Academy, like the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts. Um, these were places that did in Role students of color, though it was uncommon, you know, they were they would have faced prejudices from other students, certainly. Um, and then, of course, artists like Brown, who I ended with, um, wouldn't did not receive kind of formal training. He he sort of, in a way, stumbled upon this um, job as a working for a printmaker, which was considered at the time a kind of um, laborious work, you know, when you first start. And he just happened to um, kind of advance in the ranks and take over the business. Um, great. Tell me, uh, how did people, how did these African-American painters sell their work? Um, did uh, buyers go to their studios? Was there any sort of a dealer system like we would think of today? Were there shows? I mean, how, how did they actually market their their work? Yeah, so sometimes it was a, a combination of things. So in this period, our all artists who had studios did open their studios up for buyers. There were also exhibitions held annually, often through arts organizations. Um, An artist, so local, so the reason these artists were often successful in local contexts is because of local arts organizations that held oftentimes annual or 
biennial types of exhibitions of artists um, in which they, they, the works would be for sale. Um, sometimes they also fulfilled commissions. So, uh, you know, a collector would want a landscape of X subject, for instance, and an artist would then, you know, they would ask Duncanson, can you paint this subject? And he would execute that. Um, and that was the case uh, sometimes for um, an artist like Duncanson. He had a sort of, um, he was supported in Cincinnati by abolitionists um, communities, white abolitionists who really championed his work. And so his, you know, he, he had a successful career in part because he was able to sort of sell to them. Interesting. Um, here's a question about process. Did any of these uh, painters paint in plain air? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I know that uh, some of the white artists, they only come up to the Adirondacks and do sketches and then they'd go back to New York or Boston and Philadelphia and actually paint the paintings. So how, how did it work with these African-American painters? I think it's very similar to what our other landscape, the, the, the sort of dominant landscapists were doing in the period. Certainly there was plein air painting. That was something that all, you know, landscapists, including even going back to Durand, um, did, um, but it, it was often they were do these sketches in oils even, so not always in drawing, but sometimes they would work up entire sketches in oil and then take them back to the studio and rework them or use that as a kind of model to paint a, a more elaborate landscape. And I think in the case of these artists, it's um, almost entirely certain that they did some version of that, um, though it's possible that some of their work, maybe smaller paintings and could have been done on the spot, but the finish of these works suggests that they were, you know, at least in part done in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question about the tourism. You made some interesting connections between um, uh, white artists and tourism and privilege and the tourism industry. And, and so looking at the African-Americans, um, I, I guess they probably wouldn't have been permitted to stay at the same hotels, uh, just as, you know, Jews and, and other non-considered white um, Americans would have been excluded. So how would that have, have worked? Where, you know, where would African-American painters have stayed when they were traveling to these these tourist locations? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, it's, I don't have sort of archival evidence for where exactly they would have stayed. So we know that Porter, for instance, that painter who is known for still life, we know that he went to the Adirondacks because there's records that he traveled there, that he had this interaction with Frederick Church that led him to go, but we don't know, you know, where did where exactly did he go? Where did he stay? You know, um, it's very possible that he could have stayed within, like these artists very likely traveled within a kind of tourism infrastructure that was designed for whites, but that they could still participate in some margin, in a sort of marginalized way. Um, certainly for what, you know, what we, what we can say is for, for an artist like Brown, who was out West, traveling all around doing these graphic projects, these um, print make, you know, making prints, you know, his relationship to tourism was entirely different than an artist for, like Thomas Moran, you know, who, you know, Moran was so famous for these paintings of the West that the railroads and the hotels out there actually paid for him to stay and travel for free and, you know, so that he could produce more to attract more people. And that wouldn't have been the case for an artist like Brown, who was really linked not to that industry as much as to a kind of um, industrial, uh, sort of industrial, um, work in the region, like mining and ranching, things like that. So he is, his accommodations certainly would not have been the kinds of things that, you know, Moran was promoting that people from the East Coast were going out there to, to experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me ask you, um, you showed uh, pictures of a lot of beautiful paintings by African-Americans and I guess Canadian-Americans. Um, where are these paintings? Are these in uh, private collections 
collections? Are any of them in museum collections? Is there a great body of work out there that we're trying to track down? What, what, what's the story? Yeah, good question. So a lot of them, fortunately, the ones that I showed, a lot of them are in public collections, which is very fortunate. So many of them actually are drawn from an exhibition that's going on right now at the University of Maryland, the Driscoll Center. Um, they have a show on American landscape, which features um, African-American artists, not just 19th century, but um, but many of them are in that show. Um, Unfortunately, though, there's still so much out there, I'm sure, that can be uncovered, you know, because it's only more recently that these artists have received scholarly attention in the ways that white artists of the same period have. And so just like um, you know, 50 years ago when people, you know, Americans were discovering like Durands and churches in their attics and at antique shops all over the place. I think there's going to be a similar kind of rediscovery um, as more scholars work on these artists, as more um, you know dealers and museums get interested in their work. Um, that there are many, you know, there's many references in period literature, like newspapers and things like that, about specific artworks that were exhibited by these artists that we just don't have anymore. Often they're even described. So the hope is that, you know, eventually these things will resurface as we identify them with their painters. Because, you know, as I said, you wouldn't know necessarily by looking at these, that these are works by Black artists. Um, so in a way, you know, I think there's just more research needs to be done to kind of connect the dots. And maybe uh, one last question. To what extent um, has there been scholarship in this area? You mentioned that it's it's ongoing and you're obviously interested. Are there a lot of people out there who are looking at this sort of subject? Are there two other people rather, other than you? There's a <laughs> what, lot, a lot. And there's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, my presentation is like indebted to the research of so many other people, you know, um, and, I think that there's a lot, even just ongoing projects that deal with not just these artists, but I think, um, you know, artists of color in the 19th century in, in broadly speaking, because those artists historically have not been given their, um, you know, a, the attention that they deserve. And so um, as, you know, culturally, we are more um, aware of, the experiences of people of color historically, there's also a growth in scholarly research. Great, and maybe two last questions. We're running out of time here, but um, here's an interesting one. Are there any artists of color who might've been biracial or otherwise who were passing as white in the, in the 19th century? And are their stories different from the ones that you were just talking about? Yeah, so I mean, I found this really interesting that this artist, um, Grafton Tyler Brown, was probably passing. Um, the other artists I talked about were not, because you can tell in the literature, even though Robert S. Duncanson was biracial, he was half white, um, he was not passing because you can read in the press um, uh, coverage of his work that he's, it's, his work is linked to his to being black, to being African American, the case with Brown is a little bit, it's it's a little bit uh, murky, and I think this is probably the case of other artists. Likely too, is that you know with Brown, it's very clear that he's identified as a black artist when he goes to California, um, and when he's in Philadelphia, and then sort of as he go, then sort of the Canadian part of his career, that that racial identity is completely erased from his. Um, the, the coverage of, you know, his career, his life, um, and the fact that the census records and his death certificate all say that he's white suggests that he was passing. Um, he was not biracial, but he was definitely light skinned, as you can kind of tell from images of him. So, you know, that certainly would have enabled a kind of mobility that was not possible for Black artists. And so it, it's possible, you know, I don't have other examples of that, um, but it, it's very possible that that may have happened in cases of other artists who are who never wanted to identify themselves as African-American. 
Mm -hmm. um, here's a question. How noticeable do you think it would have been or was it noticed by critics or others that some of the figures in the landscapes you showed were not white and that they were black? Is that something that was picked up? It's it's very unlikely. In fact, um, you know, I showed the at the early in the earlier part of the talk this painting by Bannister of um, you know the of K gatherers. You know, I I don't even think the literature on him claims that they were definitively black figures. But you know, you can kind of see you know it's very lit, it's, it's a high probability based on just visual evidence, but it's not so clear that you would be like, this is an obvious thing. And I think it's, it's also key to note that, you know, the figures in these landscapes tend to be really, really small details because, you know, there wasn't this, like, they didn't want to sort of shout that out either. So um, I think there's really a, a sort of conscious attempt to diminish those details where they are when they are there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of questions, but we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I am gonna ask just one last one, and then we'll try to uh, get answers to folks after the presentation uh, to the questions that we're not able to get to. But uh, here's one. Um, are there any primary sources of the writings of some of these artists that give us insight into their philosophies? Yes, absolutely. Um, there, a really great example um, is uh, Bannister actually achieved a good deal of um, fame in Providence, Rhode Island, and he actually was, uh, the, for a time, uh, the president of the local art association. So we actually have his writings because he gave speeches there and he published, um, you know, writings about his what you know his his own history as a career as an artist and um, sort of what he believed in as, as you know what he believed art should be you know because he was in this leadership position um, and those are all sort of documented published some some you know archival but some even published sort of for uh, in local papers and things like that so that's one example in which you have a very good kind of. Um, documentation linked to actually what he was trying to do as an artist. Um, otherwise, you know, things like there might have survived some, a letter or, you know, some evidence of correspondence between artists, between artists and collectors, things like that, but um, less the kind of definitive, like, this is what I was trying to do as an artist kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Well, great. <clears throat> We're going to have to end there. Um, so Dr. Chow, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. A number of questions in their uh, range indicate um, how fascinating all our uh, viewers found this as well. Uh, tonight's presentation is just one in a series that we are doing here at the Adirondack Experience that relate to a forthcoming exhibit, Artists and Inspiration in the Wild, that will open in 2023. And some of the paintings you saw in this evening's presentations will actually be included in that new permanent exhibit. Next month, we have another in this series. The presentation will be by Dr. Diane Wagner, who's a curator at the National Gallery of Art. She's the curator of photos there. And she's gonna be doing a presentation on William Silman, who was a painter, a photographer, a diplomat, and a spy. I have no idea who he was spying for, but this sounds very intriguing. And uh, she'll be talking about work he did in the Adirondacks. And he is the painter of the very famous 1858 painting of the Philosopher's Camp here in the Adirondacks. And unfortunately, that painting hangs in the Concord Public Library. It should be in the Adirondacks. But we'll get to that next month when we hear from uh, Dr. Wagner. So again, thank you, Maggie, so much. And we look forward to seeing everybody at next month's presentation. Good night. Good night.